Uh, let's do some Q&A. We still have about uh, half an hour for a Q&A session. You can ask me to clarify something if, I, if it didn't make sense to you. Something in the video, what was going on, why it was going on, how I got started, jail stories, whatever you want. I'm here to please. Uh, somebody popped up back there first. Uh, so, for like, let's say I did want to become a vegetarian. Like price range for a week amount of food versus somebody who eats meat and goes like Walmart or Target or Kroger to the grocery stores that aren't generally pushed towards vegetarians or vegans. What would be the difference in price? It's going to be cheaper. There's a big myth out there that it's more expensive to be veg. And let me explain this in a couple different ways. Now, first of all, the cheapest things on the market are cruelty-free and vegan. Rice, beans, lentils, pastas, things like that. Keep in mind, this is why poor people, impoverished people around the world, they're vegetarians. Eating meat is a luxury. It's only cheap in America because we subsidize the hell out of it. And I want you to put one thing into the equation that nobody ever wants to put into the equation. Health, pharmaceuticals, hospital visits, doctor visits, all these pills, all the vitamins, health care. That stuff was not created for vegan. Those are meat-eating creations. I'm about to turn 40 in August. I have no health care. I take no vitamins. I see no doctor. I don't need to. I eat properly and I exercise. So if you put health into the equation, meat eating is the most expensive diet out there for sure. Also keep in mind, if you do buy processed foods, vegan or non-vegan, you always pay a little extra. If you pay uh, Turtle Island foods to make you a whole turkey, if you pay lean cuisine to make you some kind of meat dish, it's a little more pricier because somebody did it for you. So you can also, if you're really good in the kitchen, make, make this stuff on your own. Now, I got a recipe section online. I also have a restaurant section and a grocery section too. So you can always uh, look up that stuff. You can contact me, ask me, you know, how do I make this favorite recipe of yours? I will track it down. My girlfriend too is a wonderful chef as well. So keep all those things into the equation. Let me say one more too. Um, if you eat out, whether you eat meat or you're vegan, it's always a little more pricier too. So don't blame it on, oh, I went to this vegan restaurant and it was pricey. You know, Outback Steakhouse isn't so cheap either. And Longhorn Steakhouse and all these other places too. And if you eat out at restaurants, places like Subway, their veggie sub, uh, when they're not doing their $5 special, the veggie sub is always the cheapest thing on their menu, on Italian bread and it's vegan. If you go to Taco Bell, get a bean burrito without the cheese, you want to talk about dirt cheap, 99 cents. And I bring this up because students try to do this with me all the time. Gary, I understand what you're saying, but I'm broke. I'm a college student, only got a dollar, got to go to McDonald's. Well, you can do the same nasty shit at Taco Bell, too. Okay? Not the same nasty shit, because if you eat at McDonald's, don't tell me you're eating for taste. <laughs> yes, sir. So how do you get the same meat taste for a vegan meal without using meat? Yeah, if you use the right combinations of vegetables and spices, you'd be amazed what you can mimic. For instance, there's a lot of mock fish that's out there. Uh, I was talking about the shrimp from that company. If you go to a website called Veggie World, B-E-G-I-E, -E, one G, VeggieWorld.com, they got fake lobster, they got cod, they got salmon, any fish product you're looking for, they use seaweed. Seaweed gives it a fishy smell and a fishy taste. Um, you've all had a good portobello mushroom at some time too. If you hook up a portobello mushroom on the grill, it tastes awfully steaky. So they use mushrooms when they want to get a beef flavor too. Uh, the woman that, won, that, that runs my recipe section, Amy Ball, one of the best chefs that nobody knows about. Uh, I was passing through San Francisco a few years ago, and one of my perks for traveling is that I get to eat all over the country, and I, I know what's vegan, what's out there, so I stop by her house, and she says, uh, you want a vegan hard-boiled egg here? Actually, she didn't say vegan, you want a hard-boiled egg? I said, are you kidding me? You got a vegan hard-boiled egg? What do you mean? There are no vegan hard-boiled eggs. She goes, I got one for you. She takes an avocado, slices it in half, takes half of it out. Think of an avocado. Think of a yolk that's been hard-boiled. The same texture. One's yellow, one's green. She takes the avocado, puts it on some vegan mashed potatoes that she made with hemp milk or rice milk, whatever her vegan milk of the day was, that mimic the outside softness of the egg. She puts two dashes of salt down there and goes, take a bite. Holy shit. <laughs> Vegan hard boiled egg. So if you get really creative people in the kitchen, there are a lot of creative chefs out there, they can make 
anything taste like something else. So that's what they're doing. No chemicals. No chemicals. Yes. Um, do some of these meat a lot foods, do they have to go to extra lengths like add a lot of sodium or corn syrup? There's sodium taste? in there for sure. Absolutely. And, you know, salt is something that gives things a lot of taste. So you might have to look out if you want to watch your sodium. But I don't want people to be concerned about sodium before you're concerned about animal protein, cholesterol, saturated fat, all the other things. It's kind of pointless. It's kind of like somebody smoking a cigarette in my face and going, hey, Gary, you shouldn't uh, really uh, smoke that weed. I'm like, what are you talking about? If you're doing something unhealthy, what's the point of trying to find, keep away something else that, that might be unhealthy for you? Yeah. Um, from what I understand, the basic concept of veganism is not to exploit or harm living beings, right? Everything from, say, cows to even yeast. But what about, say, if you have, you have to deal with parasites, bacterial infections, diseases from that, how do you go about treating yourself? Yeah, self-defense is an acceptable form of protecting yourself. That's understandable, okay, but say, say as a doctor in your profession, you have to, I mean, you have to go in there and you have to kill living beings. Kill what? Bacteria? Yeah. So are you founder of people for the ethical treatment of bacteria? <laughs> this is, the only thing that bothers me when this is brought up is that you want to equate cows on the same level as parasites oh, and no, bacteria. I'm equating bacteria and yeast together. Okay, but do, do bacteria harm you most of the time? When they do, they're harmful. You have a right to defend yourself and, and kill something that's harming you. Now let me explain this in a different way. If you and I were walking through the woods, and a bear attacked you and jumped on you, do you really think I'd be like, oh, too bad, I'm vegan, man. <laughs> okay, I would beat the shit, or try to beat the shit out of you. <laughs> and get him off of you, this is self-defense. You were attacked, but if, 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 if some human jumped on you for no reason, I'd also protect you, too. If bacteria are killing you and destroying your body, you have a right to destroy the bacteria that's trying to destroy you. Keep in mind, cow, do not attack us. Chickens have never attacked a human being in history. <laughs> Something else I'm kind of curious about, how come we think we're better than chickens when we kill 35 to 40 billion chickens every year on this planet? We've been doing this for thousands of years. How is the murderer more special than the murdered? How is the oppressor better than the oppressed? We got this stuff backwards. We're not better than them. We're the ones attacking them. That makes us less important, that makes us worse, that makes us evil. Yes, sir. So, say the world population is at 8 billion now, and at least most of the United States is considered meat eaters, right? So, with only a certain population or portion of the world being devoted to farmland or, you know, places we can grow food, if it just seems to me that if most of the world went vegan, that it would, I mean, I, I know your quote on the 65% of the grain goes to the products, but how would we support ourselves without meat products, I guess is what I'm trying to say, or eggs or... Easily and wonderfully. Let me throw out some other stats. 95% of soy in America, it's animal feed. 80% of corn in America, animal feed. Seven percent of the oats in America, that's animal feed. If we ate the stuff directly, do you know that one acre of land can yield 30,000 pounds of carrots, 40,000 pounds of potatoes, and 50,000 pounds of tomatoes? One acre of land can only give you 250 pounds of meat. Okay, we would be using less land, destroying less habitat, if we just ate crops directly. Please go to the environment section on my website or go to a website called earthsave.org. Everybody gets fed. Here, let me throw this out there. Do you know the world's largest feed the hungry organization is called Food for Life Global? Please look them up online. When I found out about this group that solely uses vegetarian and vegan food to feed people, two million meals per day. I found out about them about 10 years ago. I also found the second largest group on the planet feed, doing Feed the Hungry stuff is Plenty. Plenty.org is their website. Both are vegetarian groups. Now, I sent a letter to both presidents saying, oh my God, this is wonderful. Finally, somebody realized you don't have to harm animals to help people. I got letters back that were almost identical. They said something like this. It's not that we do this for ethical reasons. We don't want to argue with you. We don't want to debate you on that. We do this because it's cheaper, 
and we feed 20 to 30 times the amount of people when we use vegetarian food than when we than when groups use meat. Another question? Uh, somebody up here? Right there? Um, I agree with you in the, the vegetables and fruit and all that stuff is really good for you, but I just, uh, I guess, would say processed soy is bad for you because it causes the body to generate extra estrogen. Well, here's something interesting on that. If estrogen is people's concern about soy, meat and cow's milk have twice the oh, yeah. amount of estrogen that's oh, yeah. found in soy. But let me break this down for you. So the estrogen that's found in soy is a phytoestrogen, P-H-Y-T-O, plant-based. Phytoestrogens cause no harm to the human body whatsoever. It's animal estrogens that drive the body crazy. But I got some good news for you. If you're really concerned about eating soy, you don't want to do it, don't do it. Eating soy does not mean that you can't be vegan or not eating it. There's, there's wheat meat or just get down to the nuts and bolts of veganism. Go fruits and vegetables, lentils and beans and things like that. So you don't have to make soy part of your diet. And if you want to go to my website, I hope you do. i got a brand new section about all the myths out there about soy. A lot of them are being spread by Mr. Michael Pollan, the omnivore's dilemma. And by the way, what the hell is the dilemma? Is being kind instead of cruel really problematic to people? Michael Pollan, by the way, is a hunter, is an unpaid spokesman for the meat and dairy industries. Please do not go listening to the Food Incorporated movie or to his omnivore's dilemma book. He's nothing but Ted Nugent light. And it's from Hemptown. I buy my stuff from vegan companies that pay a fair wage. And yeah, I, I don't do the uh, I don't do the Target stuff anymore, the Coles or anything like that. There are a lot of other issues to be concerned about, and I'm glad that this is brought up. But let's keep in mind the main form of cruelty on the planet is what we do with the animals. But please get involved in other issues like avoiding sweatshops, uh, trying to buy locally, and all that stuff. Find that it's you know, I got three of these shirts. I just ordered them. They were uh, nine bucks each. And yeah, they were dirt cheap, too. It's, 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 real, it's not as difficult as people think to, to, to live ethically. It only seems that way because we're used to the other way of not caring about where products come from, not caring about what happens to other animals and to other human beings. Uh, what country were you kicked out of? Oh. Uh, Canada kicked me out first in 1999. Uh, this happened because in 1997 I decided I wanted to do more than just be vegan. I wanted to actually free animals who were being held captive. So I went to a mink concentration camp, a fur farm for animals, the Ebert's Fur Farm in Blenheim, Ontario. Now, I'm from Michigan, so Canada's right across, got up half an hour, 45 minutes away. So I went to this farm and I opened up the cages for 1,542 mink. Now, mink in the fur industry are killed two ways. One, they have their necks manually broken. They take them out of a cage and snap their neck against somebody's knee. Or they gas them back to the concentration camp stuff. Now, things went badly that evening. Um, I was arrested and quickly. 540 mink actually escaped that night. I, poles were cut in the perimeter fence. There was a little dirt road. And then there were 600 acres of forest. That's all they had to do was get across the street, find the way out. Unfortunately, a thousand mink never made it off the grounds. Uh, for that, they were doomed. All I can give them or anyone else would be a chance to be free. I mean, let's face it, if you were all being held in captivity, you were going to have your neck snapped, your skin ripped off your body so somebody else could make a pair of slippers. You'd all be going, man, I hope Gary's coming by tonight. Open up this damn cage. Give me a chance. So uh, I got arrested that night. Um, I was put in maximum security, by the way. I was given a six-month sentence. I did 77 days before they deported me and threw me out, made me persona non grata. And let me just tell you a quick little story, too. While I was in jail, I was with some pretty bad people, child molesters, rapists, murderers, people who tried to stab people. They were trying to teach me a lesson. They put me in one of the worst places around. So they put me in the unit on you know, day one, kind of a holding unit before they moved me to my unit. And there's a TV set on in the corner. And the alpha male's got the clicker. And he's, 5, 5.30, 6.00, 6.30, noon. Lead story in Canada that night. <laughs> international terrorist Gary Orofsky sent to jail tonight. <laughs> Gary Orofsky, international terrorist, sent to jail. I got international terrorist with every mention of my name. I'm from Michigan. That's Canada. I am now below. So, I don't know anybody on day one. I'm standing in the back of the cell, and they're all huddled, huddled around the TV. 
And they finally realize I'm in there with them. One guy's kind of standing like this and he's looking around. <laughs> that's the guy back there. It goes around, that's the guy back there. Now the alpha male gets in and walks up to me, pretty big guy. He's like, uh, you an international terror? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> That's fine, man. You don't look like an international terrorist. <laughs> I said, maybe it's because I'm the exact opposite of one. Here's what I did. I freed some mate. They're going to have their necks broken. Now, the first thing he said to me, I preached a lot in jail. first thing everybody said to me was, what the hell's a mate? <laughs> right, uh, it's like a big ferret. It's an aerobic thing. And the next thing that was always said to me, this is not verbatim, but the intonation is verbatim. It went something like this. Wait a second. They put you in here with us? Because you freed some rats? <laughs> and the emphasis was always on us. They knew they were back with us. They said, no, no, they put me in here with you because I also caused $2.1 million in damage to the mink farm and put the guy out of business permanently to this day. And we don't tolerate economic sabotage in our society. One more thing I want you to think about. When they first arrested me, they refused to give me bail. They thought I was going to bail out, go back to Michigan, and there's no extradition for mink liberation. So I had a 10-day bail hearing. I bring this up because I challenge anyone in this room, find me a 10-day bail hearing for a rapist, a murderer, or a child molester. Won't do it, but the mink liberator gets 10 days. Now, on day 10, my attorney, Steve Rogan, found out that the same exact judge, Elaine Babcock, that had been denying me bail for 10 days, had just given a man from Michigan, three weeks earlier, $1,000 bail, second degree criminal sexual conduct. Now you know how judges can give them, they don't want to hear something in their courtroom, boy, she goes flush red, top of her voice, she goes, Steve, don't you dare bring that up in my courtroom, that's got nothing to do with this case, and you damn well know it. Now I'm sitting over in the defendant's box, I can't talk to my attorney now, he's pacing, and I'm, but in my head I'm going, don't back down, don't back down, don't back down. So he's pacing and pacing, like, come on, Steve. And 30 seconds later, he turns and he says, you know what, you're on? It's got everything to do with this case. My client tried to stop cruelty, and he wants to go to jail at this point and make a statement on behalf of the animals. You gave that guy from Michigan bail for sexually assaulting a woman, and you won't give my client bail? She looks at me for the first time in 10 days, and I was like, $10,000 bail. Now, agree or disagree with law breaking, and I hope you understand everybody that we all collectively admire Dr. King, Gandhi, Rosa Parks, uh, Henry David Thoreau, Jesus we're all radical lawbreakers. Every single person on this planet that ever made substantive change was a radical lawbreaker. Even if for some reason you don't think that I should be breaking laws or that people should break laws, you can't tell me it should cost $1,000 to sexually assault a woman for bail and $10,000 to free some rats. <laughs> Bottom line on this, sexually assaulting a woman doesn't affect the economy. And we just don't care about things that don't affect the root of all evil, money. Um, that too is me with a mask on holding a bunny rabbit, and it says presto et persto, which is Latin for I stand in front and I stand firm, and it says ALF, Animal Liberation Front, which is a group that goes around, there's no membership, but anybody that goes around and liberates an animal or destroys a place of torture is considered an ALF member. Uh, what got me started was my stepdad is a clown in the Shrine Circus. <sighs> Takes me backstage when I'm 23, and mind you, I got my blinders on too. I, I could care less about animals besides the dogs that are, you know, in my life, or if a chipmunk runs by me, I'm like, hey, look at the chipmunk. <laughs> but I'm like everybody else. I'm eating dead animals. I could care less about cows and pigs and what they're going through. And he invites me backstage and says, "You want to come see the elephants?" I'm like, "Hell yeah, I want to see the elephants." Are you kidding me? Can I bring Wendy with me too? My girlfriend at the time said, yeah, bring Wendy down. So Wendy and I go backstage. We're excited. We're like playfully pushing each other. Like, I'm first. I'm first. I'm first. And we get back there and we just stop dead in our tracks. When you see cruelty in front of your face, you don't need somebody to explain it to you. I knew what I was seeing was evil. Three elephants were lined up in chains, front left foot. Back right foot, each of them chained up to the cement floor of the warehouse of the Michigan State Fairground. 
I looked to the left, I saw, saw a monkey screaming and grabbing the bars of his prison. I saw two tigers to the right of me pacing pathetically. And I turned the Wendy part of my language, but I'll tell you exactly what I said. I said, what the fuck is an elephant doing on 8 Mile and Woodward Avenue in Detroit in the first place? She said, I don't know. And we walked up face to face with these elephants. And if you pay attention to energy, and please don't think this is weird. We do this all the time, like with babies, with infants. They don't talk and communicate. But a baby starts crying. Please, please. You're thirsty? Oh, you're hungry? You need to be changed. You figure it out. Look at their eyes. Look at their movement. These elephants were swaying like this, neurotic. Now, I'm no elephant expert, but I know that's not elephant behavior. I later found out that's a neurotic behavior every elephant gets in every circus because they're kept in chain. In the wild, elephants walk 20 to 50 miles a day. I looked into their eyes, I saw nothing but hopelessness and fear, and I knew something was wrong. So that got me thinking, where did my food come from? Where did my shoes come from? What really goes on in an animal research lab? So that's when I started investigating. I mentioned this earlier, I started going in to the Thorn Apple Valley Pig Slaughterhouse, I started going in animal research labs, and I fought it at first, like everybody does, like most people do. I didn't want to stop eating the animals. What else am I going to eat? Salads all day long? I mean, it's really like, uh, it's, it's, it's a myth out there that all vegans live off of is iceberg lettuce and tomatoes. Okay, that's not true. But that's what I thought too. So anyways, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I was a hypocrite. And here's a paradox I want you to think about. Why do we call some animals pets and others dinner? Why do we fight for the rights of certain animals to be happy and loved and safe? Dogs and cats in America. But others? Hey, slice their beaks off. Those damn hens, slice them off fully conscious. Those pigs, those piglets, rip their testicles out. Screw them. There's a major hypocrisy going on. You can see the choice that I made. All I can ask you to do is put your head on your pillow every night knowing that you are not responsible for premeditated acts of cruelty. Again, the world is tough enough for us and especially for the animals. Do we have to make it worse by eating them? There is no need in this day and age to be consuming any animal product whatsoever. It's time to let it go. So I noticed when I came in here that you were not a member of PETA. Why was that? <sighs> <laughs> uh, full disclosure, 2002 to 2005 in November, PETA funded my tour. I was never a PETA employee. I took money from them as a sponsor, independent contractor. Um, I take money from anybody to do good things with it. I don't think it's wrong to take evil money and do uh, good things with it. Now, PETA pulled their funding from me in November 2005 because they told me that education isn't important. Really? It's the only thing that ever made the world a better place, was teaching somebody else about why they shouldn't discriminate and harm somebody else. But bottom line with PETA, the corporation that is PETA, with their corporate headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia, I'm a money taker and not a money maker. I told you during the speech and I meant it, I have never once charged a school for, uh, for a lecture. I've never once charged a professor to pay me to come to their classes. I've never once passed around a collection plate to students. I do not believe you should have to pay to learn about the truth. Now, PETA, it cost me about 64 grand a year to do this tour. 35 to 40 is to travel, hotels, rental cars, food, gas. Uh, it's not cheap to live on the road seven and a half months a year. I take the rest so I can just live and pay my own bills, which is meager. It's a meager salary that I get for doing this. Um, but in the end, the accountants came into PETA's headquarters, um, Ingrid Newkirk's offices. She's the founder and president of PETA and said, you know, we've given Gary 64 grand for three years. That's $192,000. We also gave him $20,000 to put his speeches on DVD that he gave out for free to the students when he was supposed to charge them 10 bucks. When I first got these DVDs, uh, people would always come up and say, hey, Gary, I want to share this with my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my dad, my sister, whatever. And I'd be like, oh, great, I got some DVDs at 10 bucks. And nearly every student would say, I'm broke. I'm a student. What do you mean 10 bucks? I'm like, huh, okay, here you go. <laughs> so I ended up, I gave out at least 95%, if not more, of my DVDs. Well, PETA found out about that. They were pissed off. And I used to say, you guys make $25 million a year. You can't give out a couple thousand DVDs to people that are actually now begging 
to learn more about animal rights and veganism. So that, you know, obviously ended our relationship when they pulled their funding from me. But something else, I always condemned PETA when I first started, while I took their money, and now that I don't take their money, I still condemn them. They exploit women. Their tactics are so ridiculous. They're always looking for a naked woman. Like Pam Anderson. They want to put Pam Anderson's boobs on billboards all the time. Now listen, I dig that Pam Anderson kill, uh, cares about animals, honestly. But her boobs don't make anybody go vegan. Now when I used to bring this up with, with Ingrid, she used to say, Do you know how many people see those billboards than see your speech? I'm like, oh, it's not even close. Millions more. Are you telling me guys are walking through Times Square in New York City, there's Pam on a billboard, and they're going, oh, shit, look at those tits. Let's get some tofu. <laughs> There's no... No, listen, I understand. I understand why sex is used, why women are exploited to sell products. I don't like it. But if you tell guys, spray this on, and 12 women are going to tackle you in the hallway and have sex with you, boy, guys, or I'll give me some axe, spray it all over me. You tell a guy, you're going to get laid if you buy a Harley. Boy, guys, want to go get a Harley. But you show Pam Anderson's boobs, nothing. In, out, doesn't do anything. And there's a lot more horrible things going on in PETA. I actually have an essay on my website. If you click on other animal rights issues, I have an essay entitled, What's Wrong with PETA? And What's Wrong with the Humane Society of the US? Uh, which is a nothing but an animal welfare group that doesn't want to see the free animals at all. Um, <coughs> You mentioned the pet thing earlier. How do you feel about if you have pets that are carnivores and feeding them meat? Bad idea. Now, let me preface this. I do not challenge anybody's love for their dog or cat. If you're a sane person, sane people who have dogs and cats, treat them like family members, unlike Michael Vick. <laughs> but you brought up a major problem with them. Now, number one is they're carnivores. Now, this means we have to enslave and kill more cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and fish to feed the dogs and cats that we like more than the cows and the pigs. Now, hear me on this. I don't care what carnivores do on their own line. Who care? I got the Planet Life series, uh, Planet Earth series. I watched the National Geographic. I can watch a lion tear up a zebra to pieces. Doesn't bother me. But we have no business killing on their behalf. And I'll explain this in a simple way. Who's got a cat? Somebody's got to have a cat in front of somebody? Do you ever go outside and kill birds for your cat? No, uh, they bring some back. There. Thank you. Cat does it on his own. <laughs> Nobody kills a bird for their cat, but you pay people at the slaughterhouse to kill birds for science diet, items, and all the other pet food. Just like we pay people to kill chickens and pigs for us, because most people can't shove a knife in somebody else's throat. So, bad idea to have carnivorous pets. Now, good news, in this day and age, uh, there's vegan dog food and cat food. Now, this being said, I am not here to turn your dogs and cats to beef. <laughs> I did not get kicked out of five countries. By the way, the other four countries somebody had were uh, uh, England, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Even though I never set foot on their uh, land ever, they preemptively threw me out because they didn't like my essays. Uh, but I did, not get, I did not get arrested 13 times to turn your dogs and cats into vegans. But if you knew what was in dog food and cat food, let me mention the other problem with having dogs and cats, we overbreed them. Every year we murder five to ten million dogs and cats in our shelters every year. These are now slaughterhouses. So there needs to be a moratorium too until every cage is empty. But those five to ten million dogs and cats in shelters that we kill every year, raise your hand if you think they end up in a landfill. Once a week, the rendering truck comes around, picks them all up and grinds them up and sells them the science diet. Alpo and Iams and all the pet food companies. So we're making our dogs and cats cannibals, and they don't even eat real meat that they would normally eat. I never talked about chemicals in all the animals that people eat. This is for you, too. This is a whole nother issue on the side that I'm more focused about ethics and stuff. Okay, but they, they eat chemically laced meat. They eat what's left in the slaughterhouse floor, things that we don't eat. Every time there's a meat recall or a spinach recall for E. coli, you don't think that stuff ends up in landfill, do you? Science diet and I've been al uh, alpha and I am. So, this is why the vegan food is better for them. Now, I want to show you something real quick. Actually, I knew this was going to happen this summer. I have never shown this before, but my dog Rex passed away in 2004. He was 15 years old. 
and Rex was a vegan for the last nine years of his life. Nature's recipe, vegan dog food formula. Um, don't tell me Rex doesn't look wonderful, because he does. Because when I travel with him, and he came with me a lot on the road, I took him to vets when I had to, every vet freaked out and said, oh my God, you can't make your dog a vegan, Gary, because you're vegan, he's a carnivore. I'm like, go ahead, do some blood work on They'd all do blood work, call me three or four days later, say, Mr. Rowski, all the vets are in the back room right now, we are astonished. Your dog is the most amazing health we've ever seen. I said, yeah, that's because my dog doesn't eat garbage. And when I say the garbage, too, when I was at Thornapple Valley for six weeks, every day I saw a truck pull into the lot. The side of the truck said, meat not fit for human consumption. I watched the truck go into the alleyway every day, took three garbage bins and dumped them out. The garbage bins. Right off to the pet food company. It wasn't hard to track that now. So this is why that vegan stuff is better. Now the vegan cat food, by the way, is not on the market. You've got to go online. I think vegancats.com or evolution.com. Uh, but vegan dog food uh, is at uh, every pet food store that I've seen. Uh, it's called Nature's Recipe. Uh, question. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we're out of time. You know what? Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it.